to foster the natural connection between people and wildlife. Peregrine falcons are a great opportunity to talk about endangered species and DDT and, uh, and actually the comeback of endangered species as DDT has been outlawed. The center's team of 16 species of live, non-releasable wildlife ambassadors trained for presentation to audiences present over 175 programs to schools, libraries, garden clubs, senior centers, state parks, and more throughout the year. Bats are having a really hard time with white nose syndrome, so we want to save as many of them as mm -hmm. we can. So. Um, but with the white nose syndrome too, within the caves, um, we talked about that, it's actually a fungus that grows in the caves, mm -hmm. grows on the bat's faces, and it basically wakes them up out, out of hibernation. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't have basically the energy and the food supply to survive the winter, so they essentially starve to death. Mm -hmm. And it's just, mm -hmm. it, they, uh, I think it was, what, 5.6 million in... in yeah. It started in, they first discovered it in a cave in New York in yes. um, 2006, so right, since yeah. then 5.6 million, million estimated bats. People don't realize how cute they are I sometimes. Know. Has he got a name? No, we don't name mm -hmm. them, um, the patients at least. Uh, yeah. We try to not get attached or right. treat them like pets or yep. anything like that. So um, he's just <laughs> M23-12. Oh. Um, Look at that. You can see he's a little bit scared, which is why I've sure. got the fleece to hold yeah. him. So he grabs onto the mealworms there and just start munching away. Wow. Chowing now. It's like, oh yeah, I like that. Yeah. It tastes good. Great. These are um, four box turtle mm -hmm. uh, permanent residents that um, we spoke about on the radio yeah. show, actually, that um, people sometimes take turtles from the wild right. or they mm -hmm. get them as pets and don't realize that they can live um, 50 or 100 years mm -hmm. and it's a it's a really big commitment. Yeah, so. I don't remember exactly how many eggs. We have 12. Oh, we oh, had nine. 12. We yeah, had 12 yeah. eggs uh, whose mother did not make it. You know the mother's shell was totally destroyed by whenever car ran over mm -hmm. and she was on her way to lay her eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try to get through yeah, again. They're, they're trying to get away from us. But that's good. But one of our staff was able to um, extract the eggs. But I think this is a miracle because, you know, she, we had the eggs in the substrate and it took a while, but they've, I don't know if you can see them in there, but now we have nine and 12 that survived. Wow. And so they'll be this is our um, mammal room. We call this room two. We have our uh, intensive care room, our mammal room, our baby bird room, and then we have our um, baby mammal and turtle unit, which is an addition that we've had to put on as we've expanded tremendously and kind of outgrown our yeah. building. Um, so this is where when adult mammals come in and they're still compromised, they're not well enough to be in a large outdoor enclosure. They need to be checked by um, our medical staff every single day and have the weights checked and their wounds cleaned or their wraps checked and make sure that their um, fractures are healing. So this is where they stay until they're mm -hmm. stabilized, and then they'll go back out um, into the wild and, you know, into an outdoor enclosure first. The curtains are, because they're wild animals and they're afraid of us, we look like large predators, so we actually mm -hmm. keep everything covered. Sure. We, um, you know, so that they feel safe and comfortable. And beyond healing their wounds and their fractures and their emaciation, we're also treating their, sp their stress levels at the same time. So we're always working to reduce the stress of our wild patients um, while they're in the clinics. We can tell uh, by his size that he was, he was this year's baby. Um, so he was most likely born in the fall. Mm -hmm. And someone did find him. He was in the road. They're scavengers, so yeah. they unfortunately do get hit by cars more often mm -hmm. than some other species. Someone found him in the road and he had a head trauma and unfortunately they took him home. And this is a great example of why it's important to get um, wild animals to a, a professional center like the Center for Wildlife. Sure. Um, she had him for uh, a few months and he started failing and so she brought him to the Center for Wildlife and um, he had the head trauma and he was completely emaciated because he hadn't gotten the nutrition that he needs. Freya 
prey is a peregrine falcon. They are endangered in uh, Maine and New Hampshire. And uh, they actually historically would always nest on cliffs. And um, they actually are the fastest animals on earth. They dive at 250 miles per hour to catch their prey. So the parents nest on cliffs and um, they've actually kind of adapted to living on skyscrapers. So Freya's mom uh, had built a nest in the middle of Worcester, Massachusetts, and one of Freya's first flights out of the nest, she was likely um, about two to three months old, and one of her first flights out of the nest, unfortunately, she was hit by a car, um, and someone found her on the road and could tell that she needed help, so they brought her <laughs> to Tufts Wildlife Clinic uh, in Grafton, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and they're one of our partners. We exchange a lot of um, medical and diagnostics oh. ideas, and collaborate with them and so they knew that she was non-releasable so um, we were delighted to <laughs> to take Freya um, and house her and as you can see she's pretty comfortable in her <laughs> her home here this is this is a routine actually she loves taking baths. So we had a, a very creative one of our volunteers who thought of and, and a parent of uh, two kids in elementary school and thought about starting an art project that would also be educational and try to educate the kids about our ambassadors and why they're here and their lives and how we can help prevent having more ambassadors. Kristen and Lauren went to the schools and homeschoolers that want to get involved. Freya went in and told them her story through Kristen. It really took off. They really were able to capture her life and we, we tried to pick it was 35 I think, is that what mm -hmm. 35 to tell our story. And the beauty of it is the um, the animals teaching the kids, and the kids teaching one another. This is a broadwing Yep, he's over there in the corner. And this is our 100-foot flight enclosure. So this is basically the last step for our raptors. This is the last enclosure they'll be in before release. This is basically so that they can um, practice their flight skills and make sure that they can feed off of live prey. So this is a little broadwing. It's a male. And yeah, we're very excited to release this guy in the spring. So when they come in, they're usually pretty injured. They can't fend for themselves, they can't feed themselves. So we um, offer them dead mice, um, which we get from Jackson Laboratory. Um, they donate the mice to us and frozen, and we basically dethaw them and feed them. Um, once they've gained more motility and their flight capabilities slowly come back um, and they get placed in this enclosure, especially, we'll live test them. So we have a uh, little mouse farm where we farm and raise mice for live testing. Um, and then we'll put them in these little, these little boxes, these little enclosures within the, the bigger enclosure. And this basically is where we'll put the live mice and then um, monitor the bird to make sure that they can catch them. And that's basically the last step. So, so these are mostly raptor enclosures, and then oh. further back are more mammal enclosures. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of porcupine patients and uh, gray squirrels there in the spring and summertime. Mm. But um, that's so cool. we have a little barred owl patient yep. peeking out. Yep, I know. Look she at that beautiful face. Oh, now, how many different yeah. owl owls are there? Um, in New England, oh, we have barred it? owls, great horned owls, those are our year-round residents, mm -hmm. um, eastern screech owls, long-eared owls, um, we, do, we get short-eared owls, and um, sawwets, northern, uh, and the sawwets that He's migrate through. Them. Crows, they, um, you know, they're, they're very pack, or they're called murder, so they're group-oriented, they're murder? very smart. A, a murder of crows. Of crows. Yes. yes, well that yep. makes yeah. sense now. Yep, they're yeah. very smart. Mm -hmm. um, and when they oh. see any type of predator, which are usually our bigger rafters like mm -hmm. our owls, they will congregate together and surround them and even attack them oh, wow. to get them out of their territory. Wow. So fortunately, our little sawwet here, our little cricket, was um, attacked by some crows and uh, lost his, his eye. Uh, I think it's his, yeah, his left eye. Like how tall do you think? That's maybe what, six inches tall? Not even. Not That's even more like five? Yeah, four. Oh, yeah, soda can. It's pretty limited, the amount of flight. It kind of um, exhausts him. So, but uh, his impaired vision really mm. makes it impossible sure. for him to catch his food in the wild. Uh, now, Byron and Bianca should be in here. These are two that will actually put a blind up here so that the public can't see them. And when we have baby barred owls, they'll be the parents. So well, Bianca's been here for, I don't know if you guys want to know, for 16 years. And 
Byron's been here for five years. And the two of them together have actually fostered and raised over um, 30 or 40 wow. barred owlets that have been released back into the wild. We actually don't let our patients or ambassadors um, become overweight. Wild animals can actually, they're built to be a certain weight and to mm -hmm. be healthy. They can develop pressure sores on their feet, um, fatty liver disease and different um, issues. So we actually always monitor their weight and keep them at a healthy weight. He's, he's puffing up because he's um, trying. He's a little nervous, so he's trying to show you that he's bigger. He's <laughs> making himself look bigger. Yeah. Ruby and Riley were <laughs> hit by cars. Riley has actually oh. lived at the Center for Wildlife for 21 years, wow. and Ruby has been with us for about five years. We put Ruby out with Riley. Um, usually the same species mm -hmm. will get along. They did get along pretty well. They always perch next to each other. Yeah. So she's actually one of our, if not the sweetest ambassador that we have. Really? Um, we got her as a young bird. Mm -hmm. She's um, got a very gentle um, <laughs> personality and she hops right on the glove once she knows yeah, you as an that educator. You, that kids love her. Yeah. We've actually been here, so we got her about the same time as we got Byron actually. Mm -hmm. so five years, I think mm. it's 2007. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty lucky too that we, we do have volunteers that are willing yeah. to do the, the feeding and the cleaning mm -hmm. and also build um, customized oh, absolutely. <laughs> ramps like this. Yeah, she's got her own little freeway here. So Savannah, she's been with us for over five years now and she actually has a really cool story. So she was hit by a car also, but she actually came to us from Arizona. So there was a little rehab center down there, and we would kind of put our, our feelers out to other rehab centers because we were looking for a Kestrel for our um, programs. And uh, we got a bike in Arizona, so we actually flew her up uh, on a plane, which <laughs> Kristen and I always love to highlight um, in her story to imagine a little Kestrel flying on a plane. <laughs> and we picked her up in Portland. And uh, she's a very, very great educational bird. It's like migrants I live see. here, but they don't mm -hmm. spend a lot of time here. So, mm. so it is kind of rare, actually, yeah. to see them. And he was hit by a car, too? He was hit by a car, too, unfortunately. And he has a permanent shoulder injury. Um, they're called long-eared owls. There's a, a smaller version or species of this owl and they're called um, short-eared owls and they actually got their name before oh. people understood that those are part of their camouflage and they're I just see. feathers and actually not wow. their ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there she is. There's Edna. She all puffed up or she gained a little weight? Well, she has her fur coat on right now and you can't really see her quills. Mm. Pretty amazing. They have 20 to 30,000 quills on the wow. <laughs> So she's the subject of the next ambassador she book. Is. Yeah, we're telling this story. Yeah. Edna's life. She was actually found at the, at the base of a tree. We tried to get her back very quickly because yeah. there, you know, we looked at her and there was nothing wrong. And by the time we got her back, her mother had moved on. And I noticed there's uh, a lot of hemlock around. Yeah. And um, she's got some nice, great yeah. climbing trees. She can forage on her natural food. <laughs> She's coming for her close-up. And good afternoon, folks, and welcome to Positive Thoughts, the program that is proud to be on the air in an effort to make our world a better place for all animals with whom we share this planet. And you'll hear good news, good advice, and a wide variety of interviews regarding the care, rescue, rehab, and rehoming of companion animals, wildlife, marine animals, and farm animals from advocates and activists working in the many fields of animal welfare. He is actually immensely popular. So Zipper is our red corn snake, and um, he is our, or well, actually one of two snake ambassadors that we have at the center. Now, corn snakes, for people who are familiar with reptiles and snakes, um, they're not native to New England. Hmm. They're more southern um, or out west, uh, so a lot warmer climates um, in the U.S. Um, but they are. Uh, species that you can find here mm -hmm. in the States. Mm -hmm. um, but he is a beautiful red color, so they come in different colors or morphs, um, and his is kind of a, a red-orange color. 
and kids absolutely love snakes. We have converted many, many snake haters. There are people who are afraid of snakes, the zipper. Um, snakes are very important to the ecosystem, but even up here in New England. Yeah, his little yeah. tongue's coming out there, and like, how many? You know what he's doing with his tongue? When well, he's what's he got that? for yeah. fangs in there, too? No, is he is he smelling or? He not, is. You know, yeah, very good. Figure yeah. Out what's so and yeah, when they stick their tongue out like that, the they're actually um, tasting for little particles in the air, and they'll bring that tongue inside and touch it to the roof of their mouth. There's a little organ up there that actually is connected to the nerves in their brain. So it basically, they're sticking out their tongue and they can learn oh, basically wow. everything you could possibly imagine about their environment just by sticking out their tongue, which is very cool. That is very cool. Yep, so that's what he's doing right now. He's kind of assessing. He's a big fella. Exactly yeah. how long is he? He looks Yeah, he's how about four feet long. Um, he's not very wide. So he's, he's, a, he's an adult, so he's really? at least five years old. Um, and these guys of the wild can live actually to be over, you know, 25 years old. So he can, he has the potential to live quite a long time um, with us at the center in captivity. So he almost looks wet. I know he's not, but he's not. Oh, but it's <laughs> so people think that <laughs> snakes are slimy or problem. they have like okay. a slick yeah. coating to them, but they're actually very smooth, very mm -hmm. cool. Um, they they're very they're very neat. Once you feel them, it's almost the exact opposite of what you would think. That's and corn sore. snakes in, in general are very um, gentle species. Actually, farmers do love them because you know they feed on the mice that are eating the crops, but they actually don't attack humans. It'd be very rare unless you you know really startled a corn snake. They're very mm -hmm. very gentle by nature. So this is Brownie. She's our big brown bat, and I can tell she's a little bit nervous right now, but she has her mouth closed and you can see she's using her really large ears to um, sense what's going on around here. She's looking around. Mm -hmm. We actually started our bat program probably about four or five years ago and just we're noticing there's so many um, bad myths and sort of legend and um, you know it's just like any of those films or propaganda <laughs> that um, came out about snakes but wow. around here we have our insectivores, and so... That's what brownie is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, so she catches... Um, oh, she's coming alive. Insects. She actually has really, really soft, um, beautiful fur. As you can see, it's pretty mm. shiny. Very cool. Bats, uh, people do think maybe that they're dirty or, mm -hmm. you know, different things like that, but they actually groom themselves just like cats do. They're very um, frequent groom. Um, in the back, she's got teeny tiny little claws and uh, feet with um, fingers on them just like we do mm -hmm. and that's what they use to hang upside down they actually have a different circulatory okay. system than we do so they can mm -hmm. hang upside down um, all the time without having oh, getting any <laughs> that's cool though you can, hear, you can hear. I do of course have to mention our um, bats benefits to our ecosystems and just explain that quickly I know we mentioned it um, but bats do one big brown bat can eat an average of a thousand insects in one hour while they're foraging at night. So if you think about a big brown bat foraging for five hours at night, uh, they can eat 5,000 insects just in a night of foraging. Right. Um, so <laughs> beyond eating mosquitoes, which if those populations get out of control can spread disease, mm -hmm. they also eat a lot of um, beetles and flying moths, which um, you know, if you think about gypsy moths, they can actually do a lot of uh, damage to forests if their populations get out of control. Um, but she has a permanent wing injury. Bats um, do hibernate in people's houses and sometimes they use chimneys. Um, so she unfortunately was trying to use a chimney and someone, um, you know, lit their fireplace oh, and yeah. didn't know that she was there. And so that, that and being caught by a cat is kind of the most common injuries that we see our bats uh, around here so she's not able to fly well enough to be on her own so she lives at the Center for Wildlife she, she's <laughs> taught uh, so many children that bats are actually wonderful animals and so helpful to ecosystems and not um, these vampires that live in your bedroom sadly not long after our visit with the Center for Wildlife we received news of the passing of two of its beloved ambassadors Edna the albino porcupine and Riley, the amazing red-tailed hawk.
Kristen, Michelle, and Susan, and especially all of the fascinating animals there at the Center for Wildlife in Cape Natick, Maine. They certainly are doing some incredible work there. For more information, you can visit their website, www.yorkcenterforwildlife.org, and we'll be posting that contact information again for you at the end of the show. And finally, I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with a woman who has an unusual connection with the animal world and rescue. Diane DiNapoli is a penguin expert and recently wrote a book entitled The Great Penguin Rescue, in which she shares her experiences helping with the rescue of 40,000 penguins. The Treasure Oil Spill Rescue, 12 years ago in South Africa, off the coast of Cape mm -hmm. Town, there was a ship, ironically named the Treasure, that sank between two of the main breeding islands mm -hmm. for the African penguin. Mm -hmm. And at that time, their population was about 160,000 mm -hmm. birds. And nearly half the entire world population was right in the path of this oil slick. So they were at risk. Oh. And so uh, what ensued was the largest and most successful animal